greetings class. On this part of the um, recording, I'm going to talk about the Bill of Rights just a little bit, freedom of speech, uh, the taking clause, and eminent domain. Uh, those will be the main topics to discuss in this section. First, um, the Bill of Rights are, of course, the first 10 amendments at the end of the Constitution. One of the key principles to remember about the Bill of Rights is that the Bill of Rights applies to what government can and cannot do. Um, so the right to freedom of speech that we'll talk about is a right of freedom, freedom of speech in the context of a government employer. In the uh, Board of Education versus Earls case on page 101, the question there is whether student athletes can be randomly drug tested or whether that's a violation of their constitutional rights. I'm not going to talk about the case. Instead, I'd like you to take a look at it and, uh, and, and look at the court's reasoning in making the determination about whether it's okay to randomly drug test student athletes. The next thing I wanted to take a look at um, is freedom of speech and, the, and press and what kind of speech is protected or not. I guess I should, the other thing I wanted to say about the Bill of Rights information, there's other, um, there's a discussion of some other rights in the textbook. I don't want you to ignore those, but I just wanted to point out a couple of things about um, the case especially that I wanted you to look at. So don't ignore what uh, the other things that are in the book, just uh, this is you know, what I wanted to talk about. Again, I'm just giving you an overview of some of the high points to help give you a context in studying it, but you still should be reading the chapters. Okay, so in terms of freedom of speech and press, speech that is unprotected under the Constitution is speech that has a clear and present danger, um, defamatory speech, which is speech that uh, damages the reputation of individuals or businesses, whether that speech is in writing or orally, obscenity is not protected, and then pornography on the internet is also not protected. Now you can see the graphic that I have here is a graphic of lips with a megaphone and that's to represent freedom of speech, okay. Um, Again, these lists, this list of uh, unprotected speech, be sure to look at what they are. Um, I'm just kind of giving you this overview. Now, certain speech is partially protected. And when we talk about speech, we don't just mean verbally talking, although that's what the uh, diagram is that I gave you. It is also freedom of expression, or so that's conduct that, um, involves expressing an opinion. It's not just verbally saying something or saying something in writing. It can be pictures, it can be gestures, it can be conduct even if it's intended to um, communicate. Commercial speech is subject to some protection of the First Amendment, but it can be regulated. So there are a couple of things that I want you to look at in terms of uh, looking at this partial protection. One is, what is commercial speech? How do the courts define commercial speech? And then the second part is, how can government regulate it? There's a four-part test that the courts use to often determine whether the government regulation of speech is valid or not. So I do want you to go through and look at that test to um, evaluate whether speech should be, be what, first, whether the speech is commercial, because that's the key point. Here. But then second, what can government do to protect it? And what are the limits on government's uh, infringement on commercial speech? In the Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association case, it's a really good case for uh, looking at a current event, which is um, violent video games and what California wanted to do to kind of restrict violent uh, video games. So read through the case very carefully and see how the court reached the decision that it did. Also look at whether all of the judges agreed with the decision. The speech that is most protected is political speech. So on the slide I have a uh, figure that is standing in front of a podium with a microphone and that is to represent a politician uh, giving a speech. 
Note that freedom of speech uh, in terms of political speech is not limited to politicians. That's just an example. The idea is that if you have any kind of speech or expression that relates to, a, to uh, communicating uh, likes, dislikes, things that need improvement about government, then that's the most protected speech. And if you uh, think about the history of the Constitution and how it unfolded with that separation of uh, uh, U.S. citizens from England, that was one of the key uh, concerns is that people couldn't speak out against the king. And so part of the uh, founding fathers formulating the Bill of Rights was that they wanted to be sure that that kind of um, restriction was not upheld. In other words, they wanted the ability to be able to speak freely. So that's um, why political speech is the most protected of all types of speech. Now, um, in terms of that political speech, it can't be limited except to some extent as to time and place. The book talks a lot about Citizens United, which is uh, discussed on page 109. You don't have the whole case. But look at what the gov government's position was, what was Citizens United's position, and then look again at how the court um, decided the case. And there, again, a little bit of disagreement. The book also lists other kinds of speech or expression that's protected. I'm not going to discuss those here, but I'm just going to list them for you. Encryption, academic research, possibly English-only laws, and those are discussed more in the chapter on employment law. Prior restraints, um, and of course prior, prior restraints are when government attempts to prevent the speech from happening. Um, and then non-speech business. So again, look through that list and look uh, through the book as to what it says about each of those. The other concept that I wanted to uh, talk about today um, in this short um, summary is the taking clause and eminent domain. So I'm going to read through this example and then I want you to take a minute to think about how you would answer it. Sun City, California encouraged the development of Beach Park, a new shopping area. Beach Park quickly became very popular, especially with high-income adults who shopped there after work and on weekends. Among the stores in Beach Park were two stores with long-term leases, Costly Imports Company and $1 or less stores. Costly Imports Company told Sun City that it needed more room to expand or it would move the store to the city of suburb. Costly Imports Company wanted the area occupied by $1 or less stores. Sun City, wanting to keep Costly Imports Company, tried to buy the lease from $1 or less stores. $1 or less stores refused to sell. It found this location very profitable also. The city then used its power of eminent domain to condemn the property occupied by, occupied by $1 or less stores. $1 or less stores sued the city contending that use of eminent domain here was improper. What should a court decide and why? So what I'd like you to do is to pause uh, the, the video and think about even jot down an answer as to what, what you think the court would do. And then once you've done that, go to the next slide. Okay, so what did you decide? Well, the likelihood is that um, the city's action was wrong, that it violated the taking clause of the Constitution. The taking clause has two components. One is that the government may take property for a public purpose, and two, if the government does that, then the government has to uh, provide reasonable compensation. The issue here isn't necessarily the compensation. There's nothing here that talks about the city uh, paying less or more. The focus here is on whether the city exercise, exercises powers to accomplish a public purpose. And the answer here is probably no. 
basically what the city was doing is to say that, well, we want costly imports company to stay, so we want to get rid of um, $1 or less stores. There's no effort here to try to show that this was in the public interest, uh, nothing to show about tax benefits or anything like that. And even if they had, this is too directly just the city taking over a competitor because I think it will get more tax revenue uh, from costly imports versus a uh, dollar or less stores. So you see on the slide what I have is a stamp that says rejected. And what that stamp means is the stamp means that the city's, um, arg the city's exercise of its power of eminent domain was wrong and should be rejected. Now this case is, an, um, is based loosely on the Kelo case, uh, Kelo versus the city of New London. And that is a case that is worth you looking up in more detail because it talks about what constitutes a public purpose and what doesn't. And that was a Supreme Court case decided about six years ago or so. But that's a case to look at and compare it to what uh, this case is like. I want to show you just a little bit about the range of takings. And that's what this slide is about. Now, eminent domain is the power of a government to take uh, private property for a public purpose and if it provides just comp compensation. The kinds of takings range from physically taking the property, that is, you know, tearing it down, which is what the illustration was on the um, previous two slides, or a regulatory taking, uh, all the way to a regulatory taking where the government doesn't physically use or occupy the land but adopts zoning laws that deprive the owner of the use of the land. And depending on how that deprivation occurs and how much limit is placed on the owner's use of the land, a regulatory taking can be considered a taking just like a physical taking. So those are the key points that I wanted to talk about for those concepts. Um, again, read the book, but hopefully this will give you a guide as to what the, these topics are about.